welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So greetings and welcome, Martin. It's always great to have you on the, on the podcast show. I'm a big fan of your column in the FT, which you've been writing for many, many years, but I'm a even bigger fan, if I'm allowed to say that, of your books that you, you publish and your most recent one, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, I think is an excellent book. I'd recommend everyone to read it. Um, so first of all, you know, congratulations on the book and publishing the book. Thank you. And yeah, you know, before we go into the, the core of the arguments that you lay out in the book, uh, I do have to ask you, you know, how do you do it in terms of your productivity here, writing books, writing the column? I mean, what's, what's your process around it all? I don't really understand how you can produce these types of works on a regular basis. Well, it's not that regular, to be honest, <laughs> when I look at some of my friends, who what they churn out. But the answer is, I, I mean, I've really only written two major books in the last, uh, uh, what is it, nine years. And uh, by the standards of some people, that's pretty, pretty slow going. But I think do think the, that the book I wrote on globalization uh, back at the beginning of this uh, century, uh, uh, which actually, I think actually quite a lot of it holds up. The, uh, with despite many changes, uh, the couple of books I wrote on finance and this one are modestly significant. And certainly I did a fair amount of work on them. So they weren't the, the conventional sort of journalist books. Uh, they are much more academic, for better or worse than that. And they did take a fair amount of work. But I wouldn't say I'm in ridiculously or excessively uh, prolific, um, or even impressively, perhaps that's a better better adjective. Um, the uh, the oh, qualifier. The um, the uh, process is fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't write. I can't write books while I'm writing columns. Uh, I think there are some people who manage this. And writing books for me is a long, hard process because I want to sort out the ideas. I don't write books if I don't find that it's don't find that it's an important. I have to find that it's an important topic and a difficult one to which I'm de deeply attractive and which I think, perhaps arrogantly, I can contribute something to. That means almost by definition that means a lot of work. And since I'm quite academically inclined for a journalist, that means also particularly a lot of reading. And that is not something I can easily do, absorb and think about while doing my daily job, which is driven by the needs of the moment and the columns. So what I do and what I've done ever since I started writing books in the beginning of uh, now, uh, 23 years ago, at the beginning of this uh, century, the millennium, um, is I write my columns which accumulates lots of itself, some degree of knowledge, because just thinking something through for a column, reading stuff for a column is very helpful. And the background is my thinking about my next book, whatever it is. Uh, and then in the summers, uh, I basically take the summers off mostly, sometimes other holidays, but basically I write in the, in the holidays. My holidays, fortunately, the FT is generous about this. They are long. And uh, when uh, it, I really need it, I'll take a, a month or so of leave of absence. And then I write these things over successive summers. Now, in this case, this took much longer than the previous two big books, which or three bigish books, which took two successive summers. I'm reasonably quick when I get going. I'm used to writing. This book was a much more difficult affair because it involved... Uh, well, there were two big difficulties. One, the story was moving on all the time. It's obvious. Uh, 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 and second, to make a sense of it in the way that I wanted to, I had to find a way, a personally satisfactory way, of weaving together at least two, and one might argue three, somewhat different strands of thought. The first being economics and economic change and how the world economy is evolving and how that affects economic activity, employment, inequality, all that sort of stuff, including economic policy. The second strand was politics, political science, 
uh, and political philosophy, because this is about democracy and that's a philosophical idea. And, and there's a deep value there. And the third strand, which I think I did less deeply, but was clearly there, was about social behavior and, uh, and the, uh, which is in a way the link between economics and politics. Now, very few people in our very professionally divided world are very well trained in all these disciplines. And that, in a way, left me with an opportunity because I didn't feel there was not all that much competition. There are lots of journalists who do this, but they do it in a somewhat more journalistic manner than I tend to, which is a bit more scholarly and academic, for better or worse. And most economists don't think about the questions I was thinking about. I had a very recent conversation with a very intelligent economist, who I greatly respect, and basically the point he made was, well, for economists, all this political stuff is exogenous. And I, and I said, yeah, that's fine if it actually is exogenous, but of course it isn't. It's endogenous. And if you don't have a general theory of that, you don't have a general theory of economics because you don't know what's going to shape policy, like Brexit. That was an economic decision. It was a, not an, it wasn't an exogenous political decision. It was a decision that came out of both. And there are many, many examples. So you have to bring the two together and do your best to do that. And then you have to link this into a philosophical framework, which a value framework. And to do that, you have to address questions which serious people, at least, and I know from which I'm most familiar inevitably with the Western tradition, but serious people in the West have been thinking about for two and a half thousand years, uh, uh, very seriously. So that's obviously a great deal of intellectual work. And the reason I explain this at such length is it explains why, in fact, this book took five years, five summers, so instead of two. Uh, I had to redraft a lot. I, had to, I, I ended up with a book that was much too long. And my editors rightly said it was much too long. And they asked me to cut 40,000 words, which is a lot of words, and reshape some of it. And that hasn't happened before because it was really a process of creating the book while thinking it through. And in the end, at some point, you have to decide that's enough. I could have gone on forever. Uh, the subject is inexhaustible. There are so many dimensions that I dealt with imperfectly. But in the end, after this struggle, so probably over those five years, something like a year's work came out of that uh, to do this book. And that's the story of how I do it. That is great. And and uh, we're so sort of lucky to have your five years summarizing two and a half thousand years of thought uh, for, for the benefit of us. But maybe let's let's touch on those those strands. And so you do call the book, well, you mentioned democratic capitalism. So you link the two together, democracy and capitalism. And at the beginning of your book, you do outline why they are linked together. So perhaps you could articulate why uh, why you think uh, they are linked together, and 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 kind of the value proposition of of why you think that's the optimal uh, setup of society. I think that is um, indeed uh, the core question, and it brought me I'm directly in connection, in contact with some very important stra issues and strands of thought. Inevitably, uh, and I do discuss this, perhaps not in sufficient detail, but inevitably, the rise of China has sharpened these questions, right? I mean, for any intelligent person, the question of whether the Chinese have created some new way of doing all this, which will work, uh, is fundamental. I am, as I explain in my book, somewhat skeptical about how well this will work, but no doubt they did something, they've done something extraordinary. But I think the difficulties they got into, which are completely obvious, I think now, um, are a reflection of the difficulty of running a capitalist economy in a completely autocratic state. There is a tension there, and that gets to your question. So when I began to think about this, what is the relationship between our economic system and our political system, at least in the contemporary West? And my book is very much focused on that. A globalization book was actually all about developing in emerging countries, but this is really focused on my home countries, as it were, particularly the English-speaking ones of the West, but not exclusively. I think there's a lot of relevance in it for countries like, let's say, Turkey, Brazil, Hungary, Poland, 
and even India, uh, and many of my friends, and now Israel, and then many of my friends in these countries, and our friends in all these countries, um, have commented upon the the, the 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 aspects in which this sort of politics uh, uh, becomes relevant. So, what's the connection? Well, first, there's a simple historical connection. I started off by investigating the rich wealth of literature on the history of democracy, and particularly some of it sort of statistical. And there's a database, uh, it's called Polity4, but it's a rather nice database, which actually makes an attempt to, quantitatively to estimate how many democracies there have been over the last, since 1800. And of course, democracy is described quite loosely, but basically it means in countries in which the, the decision on who holds power is determined by elections in very significant measure. They're reasonably fair elections, and there's a reasonably wide franchise, not a fully wide franchise, that, uh, but a free. And the answer is, in 1800, there weren't any, uh, according to this. Um, and that's not surprising if you think of what the world of 1800 looked like. Even in America, uh, which was a republic of some kind, uh, I was rather struck with this. Uh, in 1800, the proportion of the adult population that had a vote was 6%. That's an oligarchy. You know, that's not a democracy in any sense. It's obviously not a democracy. It's an oligarchy. And, uh, of course, it excluded all the women and all the slaves, obviously, and uh, everybody who didn't have property, which was a lot of people. So that wasn't a democracy. By, uh, 80, by, by 1920 to 30, most Western countries had become universal suffrage democracies. That's pretty dramatic. And universal suffrage democracies hadn't existed before. Universal suffrage democracies hadn't existed before anywhere, as far as I know, at least in the Western world. I don't know about elsewhere in every country. So why did that happen? And my argument is, well, because actually capitalism came first, but they, capitalism is a midwife of the process of democratization. I describe them as complementary opposites. And so what it makes it complementary? Well, there's an ideological theoretical sense and there's a practical process sense. The ideological sense, and we've lost this, Mostly we've lost this idea, not all, but the capitalism is actually, a, in some fundamental sense, an extraordinarily radically egalitarian notion. In this sense, if you think about most societies, organized societies, you know, non post-tribal societies, agrarian, settled, organized, structured, with developed institutions of various kinds, and these have existed in Eurasia for at least 5,000, 6,000 years, go to speak. But what was their characteristic? Well, they were always very hierarchical. They had uh, uh, a monarch almost always, a few exceptions, and an aristocracy. The characteristic of the monarch and the aristocracy is essentially they owned all the land. And most of the rest of the society were peasants of various kinds, more or less dependent on these people. That varied over time. In some states, like the Greek and the, uh, Greek ancient states and Rome, that there, there was an independent peasantry, very important. But 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 basically, there was this oligarchic structure, and power was a, in, inherited. Power was a, simply the inverse of wealth. And it was inherited, and the way you lost it was getting defeated in war, when, whereupon somebody else came along and replaced it. And I would say, hey, if you look at the power structure of ancient China or ancient India or ancient Egypt or pre modern Europe, they all looked like that. There were, of course, many differences, but essentially what it looked like. And the, the people in charge were not only the richest, they were the most powerful, and, they, and their claim to power basically rested on their inherited position. Then along comes capitalism, and it says anyone can get into business. Anyone who can borrow money can borrow money. Anyone who makes money can make money. Um, 
And if you satisfy the wishes and desires of a large enough of the proportion of the population, you get very rich and very powerful. And it doesn't depend on who your father or mother were. It just depends on who you are. And some really extraordinary phenomena occurred, like take the most, I don't discuss this in my book, but it's an extraordinary one to think of the story of the Rothschilds. Who were they in the late 18th century? Nobody, absolutely nobody. Money changes in Frankfurt. And then suddenly, by the middle of the 19th century, they were the richest people in Europe, more or less, and with the status that went with that. And of course, if they lost money, it went. Um, this was revolutionary. And once you start saying, well, anybody who's able and talented has a right to get into uh, e the economy in this way and become rich, well, of course, they become influential in the same process. And But you get more and more people like this. The, a large middle class emerges, a large prosperous middle class, an increasingly prosperous working class towards the end of the 19th century, increasingly organized and they all start saying, me too. Uh, and this is society based on law and ultimately, to a significant extent, consent. How else can a market economy operate? You need stable rules which are underpinned by consent and the rule of law. That's how the market economy operates. So when people start making these claims and say, well, we should have a say in political power too. And by the way, it was as a matter of practice, the capitalists found they needed an educated labor force. They all started backing universal education. By the late 19th century in Europe, most societies had achieved at least something close to universal basic literacy. That's a very important change. And the most successful societies had really achieved it rather successfully. And then they sort of could organize properly and they could make demands. And, and over time, the franchise was extended more and more widely because the alternative was civil war. And the capitalists, capitalists on the whole didn't want a civil war. They wanted a nice, stable market economy where they could go on making money. And this was reinforced by other things, which are the, the, the need to conscript and create armies that could defend societies. But this became, I think, a very natural process. It's very well described in the literature. It didn't happen everywhere. It didn't happen in Germany, but it happened in Britain. It happened in America. And uh, to give you one example, which isn't in my book, but it, you know, what was the biggest, one of the biggest forces for the end of slavery? It was a free labor, a um, late market labor in the market saying, we don't want to be com compete with people whose products are uh, the result of violence and suppression because it's not fair competition. Uh, that was actually the free labor argument was one of Lincoln's most important um, planks of his of his view of the world. Um, so that is a very long answer to a fundamental mm -hmm. question. Now I make one other. So this is the way they're complementary. They're opposites because capitalism can lead to extreme inequality. It can lead to profound economic changes which people can't accept. And in that situation, there can be two possible outcomes, both of which go back into history. One is that the, the people who feel that they're being cheated, that they're not getting what they want, will do what Plato described actually in Athens, which is go for a demagogue. And a demagogue is somebody who pretends to be a Democrat, but is in fact wants to, to be a dictator. And we've seen that already in Athens, and we've seen this many times again, and we're seeing it now. And the, out, the counter to that, but it's not necessarily a counter, is a, re a re restored plutocracy. If there's an extraordinary concentration of wealth and power back in the capitalist system, they can, of wealth, it's going to lead to a concentration of power. This leads to essentially the reestablishment of a plutocracy. And the most dangerous thing I think of all, which is what I worry about most, and I didn't get this in front of the book, is that the oligarchy and the would-be demag demagogue combine to produce uh, a new autocracy with usually a crony sort of capitalism. And that's way, the way they are opposites. But I would stress that there are ways in which they really do benefit each other. Uh, I, as I argue, I don't think you can have a democracy without uh, a market economy of some kind because you need people who are independent from the political process, particularly a sizable middle class, who can live under either alternate or the alternate political 
power groupings. They because they are independents, then their life doesn't depend entirely on politics. And who are independent enough and well informed enough, so you need independent media to gain that really can only exist in a democratic and capitalist society, independent media that inform them of the choices which allow the different parties, including the ones not in power, to address them. So you need uh, need a democracy uh, for that, and uh, democracy needs some form of market economy. So it's not at all an accident. Let's be very clear. There has never been, whatever they say, a democratic socialist country. There can't be. Um, because the power concentration in the, the pans of politics are too great for the politicians who control the system. Everything depends on continuing to control the system because if they don't, they're nobody, absolutely nobody. They can't defend themselves at all. And uh, and the and for the people, well, they're completely dependent on the government. So how can they really mobilize against it in any real sense? Uh, given the levers of power. But I also argue, and this is the very last comment in this very lengthy answer, which is that um, capitalism needs democracy for many reasons, but the most important is precisely to prevent the monopolize, the the concentration of power in a small uh, and possibly predatory plutocracy. Uh, um, And this is why competition policy, broadly defined policy to open up opportunity to the widest possible range of potential entrepreneurs is such an important part of successful capitalism. And I was reminded of this discussion I had very recently with a German friend, because that was precisely what the so-called auto schools of liberals who came into power or influence in the post-war World War II period articulated as the most important role of the state in preserving capitalism and democracy simultaneously. So those, mm. as quickly as I can, I mean, you're, you're, are, I mean, are you're my reasons such... for thinking this is a interconnected, complex, fragile, but fantastically valuable system and nothing that is happening in China and very much not what is happening now in China persuades me that any other system is going to do better. I mean, you, you always give such uh, comprehensive answers. Um, I do want to attack it in different ways. But one one critique is, say, from someone like Noam Chomsky, who basically argues that it's really capitalists that drive um, the system, and we really have a plutocracy masquerading as a democracy. So basically, you have the capture of the state by capitalists and democracy is kind of this way of appeasing the masses. And with things like you mentioned, independent media, uh, you, you through capitalist ownership of the media, you manufacture consent and, and so on. So this notion of people having this liberty or individual ideas, you know, uh, you know, doesn't doesn't actually hold in reality. I mean, what do you say to that critique? Because that's quite a. OK, um, yeah, it's a very standard. Well, the. The forefather of this critique, as far as I know, was somebody called Karl Marx. Yeah, uh, true. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, very, very much so. He thought that what he called bourgeois democracy, well, I think he called it bourgeois democracy. I'm pretty sure it was it starts yeah. with him, um, was a fraud. It wasn't real at all. Well, it's sure as much wasn't as big a fraud as democratic socialism, <laughs> uh, uh, where, you know, uh, the, the the people in power over the state also control the economy and put everybody they disagree with in concentration camps and kill the vast number of them. And this has not stopped. Uh, uh, so we can safely say that democratic socialism is empirically uh, uh, a will of the wisp, uh, a, a vacuum intellectually. So anybody who tells me, well, the alternative is democratic socialism is, in my view, genuinely talking about an intellectual fraud. And I like Chomsky, but I think that's just obvious. And you, I can go through the history of every country that wanted to become communist, and some of them who pretended that it was going to be democratic. Of course, it couldn't last, and it didn't. On this point, which is a big Hayekian point, Hayek was right. right? Okay. Uh, the liberals were right. Uh, the... Now, to get back to your question, 
I tend to, my whole philosophy of life is nothing is complete, perfect. Mm. Uh, all life consists, all real human life consists, and particularly in complex societies, consists of trade-offs. So it's never a one-zero choice. I make this point about some propositions of my good friend, Daniel Roderick. It's never a one-zero, it's trade-offs. It's perfectly true that in a, a capitalist economy, um, capitalists have relatively great power. It's completely wrong to think, particularly if you run it well and aware of it, that they have all the power. I mean, it is pretty obvious if you look at the history of Western thought and political movements since, say, 1800, that intellectuals, my God, they've been powerful, including Karl Marx, but also Jeremy Bentham and the, the Mills and, and the influence of Adam Smith before that and Edmund Burke and, uh, and uh, many other thinkers have guided people's thought. They've guided people who are educated, therefore people who run the bureaucratic machinery, people who teach the future generations. And my God, they have had powerful influence. So the idea that only power and money matter, I mean, intellectuals matter enormously. It's obvious they do. Um, secondly, other interests matter because, yes, money matters, and of course it influences politics. But if you organize lots of people and you're allowed to organize lots of people and to put together the money of lots of people, and have institutions that represent them, like civil associations, trades unions. Uh, trades unions are really important. I've become much more aware of this than I used to be. They can exert tremendous influence through their appeal to many people. And for capitalists to ignore that completely means turning the society into an overtly violent and suppressive society. In my view, is that overtly violent and suppressive societies create two mortal threats for capitalists. One is the person in charge will be a despot, and the despot will seize all their wealth, um, basically, or control it. And that's the demagogue point. But the other is that they will lose the consent of the people. And that means all their workers. That means all their customers. That It's very uncomfortable to be a loathed capitalist in a, a free society, which is why so many of them have come become, as their opponents hate it, a woke, quote unquote, because that's what their customers and workers wanted. So the idea that this is all fraudulent, that the campaigning, the engagement of people uh, in politics has nothing to do with what fi finally happens. Well, of course, that's not true. We wouldn't have created welfare states, massive welfare states, if that was true. Do you think the capitalists wanted that? No, the people wanted it. And they discovered it was the only basis of a happy society. And the alternative was a was a fascist state. And they, on the whole, sensibly decided that wasn't a good way to go. Now, that's a battle that is fought in every generation. But it isn't a sham. It's just a little bit of a sham. <laughs> but everything in life is a little bit of a sham, even a happy marriage. That's a, that's a, I mean, that's, that's a very fair response to the Marxist slash Chomsky critique. Um, the, the, the other one I would say, uh, put forward is more about whether what this, this balance between capitalism and democracy is a one-off like a post-war phenomena that, you know, had a good run for like 30, 40 years. And it was to do with specific factors of coming out of a war, having a communist threat. So, so even the capitalists would say, look, we don't, we don't want to go in that direction. Um, you had a sort of a manufacturing base, which allowed low skilled workers to have jobs, you, you know, which allowed, you know, the unionization and, you know, so there was a certain set of contingencies that, allowed this balance to occur and whether that's gone now. And so any solutions that don't recognize that will be doomed to failure. I think that's a much deeper question. I mean, a much more convincing question. Yeah. And uh, my answer to that is going to be completely honest. And I think it's very clear in the book, but perhaps it could have been even clearer. 
well, I do discuss it a bit, um, that I really don't know. <laughs> there is a, because history hasn't yet unfolded, it is perfectly fair to say that close to universal suffrage democracy, wide suffrage is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, it has proved most stable in prosperous societies which are highly educated and reasonably equal in the income distribution. And some of that was because of shocks like the wars. And some of that was because of, as you say, contingent, broadly speaking, contingent economic factors, such as the role of industry, the, 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 the monopoly of industry of the Western world, uh, the lack of competition, uh, therefore very large amount of rent, which could be comfortably shared between workers and capitalists, and uh, and a political consensus formed partly by war um, that meant that they really didn't want to go back to the conflicts of the early 20th century. And so highly consensual approach to policy making, even in the US. Um, and I think of the post New Deal. And that's over. Uh, you know, we don't need universal conscription, conscri universal conscription armies anymore. So lots of people, it doesn't matter if they're very unhappy, we don't have to make them fight for us. We've lost the monopoly, capitalist, uh, uh, um, industrial know-how. Uh, capitalists can move where, wherever they want. Uh, so they feel more detached from their societies, citizenship erodes, um, and politicians feel completely increasingly helpless. And because they feel increasingly helpless, they become increasingly despised. And the people no longer are engaged with them or with the, what they do. They just think they're a joke. Politics itself seems a joke. And then you get along a politician who somehow combines per, who combine perfectly the notion that, one, politics is a joke. And because it's a joke, the, right, the answer to that is to, to go for them. And they're not going to do anything for you, but at least it's going to be fun. And they're going to beat up people you don't much like. And that's where we end we dive we go out with a whimper and um i think that story is perfectly plausible uh the purpose of my book is to say that's that story you know that could be where we end up um but i don't really believe at least i'm not prepared to accept uh the predestination of it uh, that there is no other outcome but i recognize completely that the risks of that what you say is going to have of what you set describe are happening are very real. It is probably going to be quite a big battle to prevent it. Um, and it may be naive of me to hope that it will be prevented. But I just feel, well, what else, what's the alternative to say uh, the future lies with uh, corrupt thugs that's the best we can do in running our societies with all that we know that's likely to mean um that can't be accepted and it's not in truth what i believe most of our populations actually want um it's only in the countries i know uh um so we have to fight for something better it is always possible that you know in great fights that matter to people, you will lose. Uh, you know, when people started the second, when the British decided to take one of the heroic moments of this country in uh, 1939 to fight the World War and to go on fighting it after the fall of France, well, lots of sensible people, and many of them were in the cabinet, said, well, it's crazy, we've lost. Uh, but uh, I don't think accepting defeat before we've even started the battle is a very decent or proper thing to do. I believe that two things. Two, first of all, of the many lousy ways we've governed ourselves, this is quite massively the least bad. Churchill understated it. Uh, I mean, you know, pretty basic point. People want to live in our countries and they don't want to live in our countries. Of course, it's much because we're prosperous. I understand that. And I understand a lot about 
the, the questions about how that world was created. I'm going to, I discuss that briefly. But they want to live in it also because they feel living in a society which is free, which has a law that protects them, where they can express their views without being put in prison. Uh, that's rather nice, right? That's rather, it's what most people want. Well, if people want this, and you have highly educated populations, and you have, if you have, um, you know, the, the plutocrats who are more aware, some of them are at least, that the way they're going will not end up in a world they're going to like very much. There's more to life than having low taxes. I, then I have to be optimistic that there will be a way found forward to recreate it and people will look at how close we've come to disaster and will change but i recognize uh, this is where i started my book as you know um civilizations even great civilizations everything in our history tells us this are profoundly fragile anything sophisticated complicated which demand dem always by definition such a thing depends on consent. It depends on willing engagement of the public. And that's even more true in a society like ours. All that is fragile, and we have to fight for it by making everybody so far as we can can feel included and part of it. And that is my story, and it may be a hopeless battle. I don't know. Nobody, I think, knows. But I won't believe it, and I'm very happy to have engaged in it. And let, let's pick a, a couple of the, the, the big thorny uh, economic issues that have really caused some of the stress in, in, in this system. One is globalization. We had the Brexit vote. We had the Trump, you know, trade wars. You know, ha, you know, we were told for years the neoliberal order, globalization is good. It's, you know, it's a win-win and so on that turned out uh, not necessarily to be correct. You know, people within the in Western economies felt marginalized and so on. And then we had the result of, say, Brexit and, and Trump and so on. So an issue like globalization, I mean, how would you think about that? Have you changed your view on globalization? You wrote a book, of course, about globalization many uh, uh, a number of years ago. And, and now we've seen, you know, uh, you know, the, the way society has reacted to it. Well, my general argument which I think it's controversial, I, I hold to it, but I think it's an argument others would differ with, is that in large part, not entirely, but in large part, the, um, the problems we've got into are a function either of inevitable economic changes to which we fail to re react. So I argue, for example, that the biggest single change which is the deindustrialization of the labor force in the Western world, was predominantly due to technological changes that were separate from globalization. And I think the evidence of that is very strong. Lots of work on that. And uh, the other big changes to do with the shift in a skill-intensive direction in labor demand, particularly university-created skills, and the extraordinary increases in incomes at the top of the income distribution, again, had very little to do with globalization per se, but had a lot to do with, again, technology and the certain forms of, uh, of capital market liberalization, which I think of as distinct from, though linked with globalization. So I, I think that the story is, as a matter of fact, uh, more far more complex. I first. Second, it does seem to me clear, uh, this is not so much, and this is, I'm very careful, I want to distinguish globalization from belief that, you know, completely liberal markets are perfect. You, know, you will know um, in the literature of which I'm most familiar in trade, people long ago, uh, a very distinguished friend of mine, Jagdish Bhagwati, wrote some very wonderful pieces on this in the 60s, which was basically arguing, yes, there are lots of arguments for intervening in an economy, but they're not on the whole good arguments for protection. And we forgot that. We forgot that. Uh, we pretended 
that uh, if you were against protection, that meant you were in favor of completely free markets. The two cases got alighted, but they are distinct. There's perfectly good arguments for interventions. Of, some of them you might call industrial policy. That's a, some of them are to do with labor market policy. Some of them are to do with regional policy. So, some of them are to do uh, uh, with, with welfare state compensation for risk, for risk bearing and, and so forth. Some of them are to do with corporate governance, which is a big issue, I think. Some of them to do with the way financial markets work. God knows we have problems with that. None of these are directly linked to the case for free trade. They're quite separate. And I don't, I, I, in my first book on globalization, and even more of this, I want to separate the arguments for trade from the arguments from completely free markets. I tried to do this. There are lots of arguments for, for intervention in our economies. It's difficult to do well, but I discuss a lot of it. And it, but it needs to be done. There's no question that complete laissez-faire is not a sensible policy. And that's been obvious since the middle of the 19th century, I would say. And the, the, the fact that we're still debating that is very strange. But accepting that there's a case against laissez-faire, a very big case against it, is not the same thing as saying the best tool is protection. And this then links to my final point. The reason we go for protection when what we want is intelligent interventions of many kinds is because it's so easy to blame foreigners. It's a political thing. You know, so let's take America, which is an important case, but I know it's all Europe, Britain, with you know, what happened with Britain? Uh, we had lots of problems in the British economy. Those of us in Britain about them for a very, very long time know that they were overwhelmingly due to domestic policy failures, none of which were in any way actually affected by EU membership. You know, our inability to build houses, our inability, which is planning controls, our inability to do sensible regional policy, our ridiculous over-centralization over of government in our country, the failure to improve our schools for, and education for skills, the failure to create new uh, innovative companies in the tech sector, which succeeded, the, the loss of dynamism of our capital markets, none of this had to do with the EU. None of it. The EU was trivial in all this. So the, why do we blame the Europeans? Because they're foreigners, and it's easy to blame foreigners for the things we're not prepared to, to comp confront ourselves, and it became perfectly obvious, surely to anyone after the Brexit referendum, when it was quite clear they didn't know what to do about anything, that actually nothing that they uh, needed to do was made easier by Brexit, because it was never affected by the EU, and they were as cowardly about doing any of these things as they'd always been, because the reason they couldn't do it, it was because it was so domestically sensitive. And the same applies to Trump. The idea that the principal problem for America, if you look at all its social and economic problems, its trade with China is simply not borne out at all by the evidence. Yes, there was a China shock that could have been dealt with much better. Of course, there was uh, uh, there was insouciance about that, but it's a trivial part of the total story. Now, one area I would say that what I say is more questionable. That's about uh, capital outflows and capital flows more broadly. My friend Morris Obstfeld, I think I, I reflect that in this book, but if not, I've made the point elsewhere, has argued that what's so surprising when we get anguished about globalization is focus on trade, which is second order. We don't really consider what finance has done, which is closer to first order because it has a massive influence on corporate governance, it's a massive influence on financial instability, which has been a very big issue. And it's a massive influence on uh, the position of labor because capital has the opportunity for exit. Now, those are, I think, questions that do need genuinely addressing. I discussed some of those. Perhaps I should have addressed more. Tax avoidance is a big issue in that context. But the globalization that I would argue has mattered least or the globalizations that have mattered least are the ones we are most 
paranoid about trade and migration. Uh, um, and, and, and that's not an accident. It's because it's so easy to focus on these people and not on the powerful people whose role in other areas is actually far more significant. I think now I would have been stronger on this point in writing this book than I did was, but there, there's a reason for that, which I will keep this mistake by saying that I do want my book, I'm sure I'll fail, but I, to, I don't want to create a war cry for quote unquote progressives. I want to create a consensus, if I can, among what I think of as same British politics, relatively sensible Starmer, let's say. I think there is no reason why Starmer and Sunak, who are fairly sensible people, it seems to me, shouldn't agree there is a problem. This is the sort of problem we have. And these are the sorts of policies we should be pursuing. I want that sort of consensus to be formed because that seems to be the only basis for what progress. And then that leaves the, you know, uh, the Chomsky's on the far left <laughs> and the complete crazies on the far right out in the out and to do out. And that's what I wanted. So I didn't want to be so radical as to really frighten the horses. And that perhaps explains it. But I think I have explained my big point. Most of this is xenophobia. Xenophobia is the most powerful motivation in human affairs. We are always naturally tribal. It always leads to trouble. And we should try, if we don't got any sense, to control, curb, and manage xenophobia. Because once you really let it rip, and surely you know this, anything can happen. That's very powerful arguments there. And I think I like your nuance around globalization about we should be clear about what we mean by globalization, which area of globalization, role of technology, what you can blame and so on. I did want to pick up on the financialization point. And one thing is obviously we've had uh, deregulation of financial markets since the 80s onwards and open capital accounts. I mean, would you advocate for... Uh, you know, capital, um, uh, uh, restricted capital flows, cross-border capital flows, or, or not, like a return to capital controls of some kind? Um, the honest answer is, but, you know, my book is already ridiculously big, and it discussed <laughs> the ridiculously large number of policies, and many critics would say, there's too much in this. You don't have a, sim a single answer for all this, or no, not even a single... Two answers, and the answer to that is no, I don't because I don't. Uh, but I have read a lot of literature, and I'm not convinced anyone else does either. The uh, I think my answer to you in general is no. Uh, that is to say, I am reasonably comfortable actually with the position I adopted in my globalization book, which is. Um, I think the high income democracies can contain and manage financial liberalization reasonably well in its cross border effects, uh, as long as they're reasonably sensible, because they have the, uh, by and large, the, the confidence of the markets, not perfectly, but they do. That gives them very substantial degrees of freedom. They issue reserve currencies to a greater or lesser extent. Um, that allows them to manage counter-cyclical policies. And it's they are part of a, a global and above all Western system, which is centered, in on which the financial system is centered. So I think for us, for the Europeans, the Japanese and Americans going for exchange controls would be pretty ridiculous. But if I were running India or China, and I'm not, uh, I would say, and they came to, should we get rid of all our current capital account controls? I would say what I've been saying for now a long time, way back since I wrote about the Asian crisis, think about it very, very, very carefully before you start. It's not the most important thing for you to do. And there are many situations in which you will lose control over your domestic poverty if this happens. And that's a very bad place to be. So I think the case for emerging, I was very skeptical about the case advanced in the early 90s by the IMF for universal 
capital account liberalization, the Asian financial crisis sort of killed it. And I think that's right. Um, now, I'm more concerned in our countries about other aspects of financialization. And to me, the area where I think I'm weakest, but I raise all the right questions, is corporate governance. How far do we want corporations to be run, as it were, for the interests of capital market players? And what is the consequence of doing that? And I think there are some very big questions there. I don't, uh, and and perhaps, so that's one really big, I give some answers there, but I, perhaps I should have gone further. And the second big issue is where I think the West is beginning to understand is we cannot allow capital account liberalization to mean complete control, loss of control over the ability to tax capital income and capital wealth. We can't have hugely powerful people living off the institutions we have created and the societies that support those institutions without contributing to them as taxpayers. And, and for that reason, I, I'm overwhelmingly behind the, the attempt of this administration to create a sort of universal minimum corporate taxation. And I think uh, basically tax havens should be demolished. I think that, and I discussed that at length, I mean, they are absolutely lethal predators and the corporations should not be allowed to place huge amounts of their inter valuable assets, above all intellectual property in the current world, beyond the network of domestic uh, taxation and regulation as well uh, in this way. And we have the power to stop it. Of course we do. Uh, you know, if we told the major Western companies that do this, that if they continue to do this, they can no longer operate in our countries, that will be the end of it immediately. I mean, it's perfectly obvious. Do you think the US can't prevent Western uh, American companies from taking advantage of this? Now, this is, gets where Chomsky is right. That's a, it's not that the plutocrats rule the whole of society, but they rule it pretty effectively in certain narrow areas. And taxation or regulation are very definitely part of it. And we've seen this again with banking, with this ridiculous deregulation in the US that allowed these recent absurdities. Because of pressure, pressure allowed. Can we eliminate that? No, not in a democracy. But should we be aware that a lot is going on, in my view, in the political process as a result of very careful and deliberate um, special interest lobby, not a general uh, assault on everything, but special interest lobby, particularly focused around the financial sector, though not only. And, that, and that's a big issue. That seems to me obvious. And I just wanted to round off and find like, you know, finalize our interview with just one a final sort of question. Um which is, you know, you touched on if you have sensible politicians in charge, you know, UK, you mentioned Sunak and Starmer seem reasonable in the US, whoever that may be. What types of policies do you would you advocate that they implement? Or what, what policies in general do you think we need to uh, restore that, uh, you know, uh, to get rid of this crisis of democratic uh, capitalism? Well, my view is... Uh, this is very different. America is a sui generis country, and in, and in a way, you need to, to generate a whole set of ideas about how to make the American past consistent with a decent American present. And I'm not going to focus on that because that's a whole new discussion. I have views on that. But in the British case, I, my view is the, roughly the following. Britain is a, a European country. I know we don't want to think we're a European country, but actually we are a European country. The countries that are most like us in terms of attitudes about it's all perfectly clear for the are continental countries. I think the British people have been sold a bill of goods. Uh, I don't know whether this can check. The bill of goods is you can have a fully developed, sophisticated welfare state and pay significantly less tax than anyone in continental Europe. And that's a bill of goods. And I think the British public actually wants, I'm not talking about becoming Denmark, but they would like the welfare state that the Dutch offer, much richer country, by the way, and perfectly successful. And that means we have to pay more tax. And that means I have to pay more tax. And 
that's what we have to do. And I want like politicians to persuade the British public that that's perfectly reasonable. So our welfare state is going to become more expensive. We've always known that uh, because of aging and because of the risks that we're now being asked to bear. But if we don't do that, we're going to have more and more of these massive social problems. And by and large, not completely, on many of the continentals, I think, have handled this better, particularly in Northern Europe. Um, so that's the first point I would make. I want this, and I've made this point for about 25 years in various columns. You can't have a European welfare state on these tax ratios and the problem will get worse. Now, of course, I didn't expect us to go almost X growth. But the second point is we have a really big growth problem and we know that and it has many dimensions. Um, so we need to have a serious package. And what are the key things? Well, pretty obvious. The national savings rate is far too low. We underinvest chronically, both privately and publicly. Uh, our tax system has not been well designed to promote savings and investment. Um, we, under, we are under saving in our pensions. Uh, we are under investing in our pensions. We have done a pretty, we are beginning to get some good ideas, I think, on skills, but we have been not willing to invest in them. That comes back to the tax issue. We need, uh, I do think we have to ha develop, and I have ideas about this, a serious regional policy. We can't just have one region of the country, which is world-class and the rest is sinking. And, uh, and we need an industrial innovation policy, which in my view is built around the combination of massive inventions in, in science, science and engineering and, uh, and massive uh, promotion of essentially VC related, public, private, private related uh, innovations. And I think the, the most successful model of that, which might be relevant for us in these areas, was DARPA and, uh, in America. And they, it's the most successful industrial policy tool ever. And we, should, we can put the money involved in that is not that large. And and similarly, and we could do that in the areas as I think that was one Dominic Cummings' one good idea in in uh, in, uh, I, in information technology and life sciences, which are both very good areas for us. We have some good people, and we can track earth based skill. We have to reopen our society to the very best, and to some degree, we're doing that. The best scientists and and would be scientists and technologists and entrepreneurs from around the world. And I think we're beginning to do that again. I'd be, we'd be much better on immigration policy than I feared. When I read how many immigrants we've got, I feel great. And, uh, and the, but that means of course, we have to get to planning and housing and building. Uh, so it's a lot of stuff um, uh, at the end of this. Uh, and, uh, and I think if we, and finally, we need to have a financial innovation. Finance is important, but it can't run the economy and it isn't going to be our only source of value added in the world because it's too narrow and too fragile. Now, so I would say we, have, we, we just have to step back and say, look at where we are now in the ramp. Some of what we did with Margaret Thatcher was right and good and worked. But we overinvested in the idea that deregulation will do it. We failed to deregulate in some of the most massively important sectors, activities like planning and uh, land use. And we ignore that in addition to deregulation, you have to have a policy for innovation and capital accumulation. And having the lowest savings and investment rate in the developed world, which is we do have uh, with uh, a pretty feeble technology promotion innovation policy creating moving ideas into activities without that it turns out in them for a modern sophisticated economy which isn't world class in scale like the US it's not enough and that's what I would focus on
Now, how what that means specifically, whether any politicians can do that, I don't know. But I think we've got to ditch Thatcher, as it were. We've done that. Now we move on. Uh, it wouldn't be like Biden, because God's sake, we can't get a subsidy war with the US. That's mad. But we have to find our own way of using our deregulated, liberalized society, deregulating more in certain vital areas and becoming a serious accumulator of capital and know-how. And uh, that seems to be the broad strategy for Britain. Is that doable? I don't know, but I can't see what the alternative is. And that's very compelling arguments then. I hope, uh, you know, politicians and all the movers and shakers do listen to this. Now, uh, I, I would urge all our listeners to buy your your book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. It's on Amazon. I, I bought it on, on my Kindle uh, and I sort of very much enjoyed the read. Obviously, Martin, you have your column in the FT, which people can read as well. I also see that you have um, a mini sort of podcast series where you, uh, you're you interviewing um, or having discussions with prominent you know, thinkers uh, to elaborate on some of the themes in your book as well, which I'd also recommend people. That's um, it's it's uh, what was the name of the show? It's FT. Saving Democratic Capitalism, and it's in FT Podcasts. FT Podcasts, and yeah. uh, and it's going to be a five part series. And uh, this Saturday, uh, the, I don't know with the timing of this. So, but the next one going up is with Anna Fulbaum, which is wonderful. She's a wonderful woman, and yeah, I think it's quite a sobering. Uh, and intelligent, I would say that, wouldn't I, series discussing with some quite significant thinkers on, to me, not the only big challenge of our time. There are so many others, but the one that is closest to home for me uh, because it's the crisis of my own home. Yeah, uh, that's great. Now, with that, thanks a lot, Martin, and thanks a lot again for your columns, your book, and all your contributions you're making to this this debate. Well, it's wonderful to do it. It's been a particularly rich and uh, inspiring uh, discussion. And it makes me think, if only I could start rewriting writing this book from scratch. But I, you have to move on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Martin. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.